to see everyone. I want to welcome everyone, and if there's anybody new today, welcome them also. Um, I just have a few announcements. They're in your bulletin. I think one of the most important ones is Daylight Saving Time ends Sunday, November 3rd, or begins. Which one are we on? It ends. So I think next Sunday we might have some people early or late, but, <laughs> but just play it by ear and be here at 1030. Uh, another announcement is the church committee reports should be in by November 3rd, and then the annual meeting is November 17th. Um, Matt Wolf will be preaching today. I just met him a few minutes ago. I've seen him around, but really did not know who he was. So we're glad to have him today with us. Um, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, the times are in the bulletin for the Bible study on the Gospel of John. So if you're coming to one of those or would like to start coming, they are given here in the bulletin. Next Sunday is Sunday School, Confirmation, Coffee Fellowship, and then of course, Worship. Are there any other announcements that I should be aware of? Don't see any hands, so let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would be with us today in our worship. That you would calm our hearts and our minds. A lot goes on in our lives from Sunday to Sunday. Help us to look to you for comfort, for strength, and always remember your love and forgiveness for us. Thank you for your concern, Lord, for each and every one of us. Sometimes it seems like maybe you're not hearing us. Maybe our prayers go out in vain. But as we heard last Sunday or the week before when Pastor Tom preached, many scripture references from your word that you hear our prayers, that you want us to pray. And most importantly, you answer our prayers. Thank you, Father, for your care for each and every one of us. In your name we pray, amen. All right, we're going to sing holy, holy, holy.
We just had to do that one a cappella at the end. It's beautiful. <laughs> from Psalm 121, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. have a word of prayer before we go into our confession of sin. Father, what would we do without daily coming to you and confessing our sin? Lord, I need that hope. I need that promise. I need the words that you give us, taking away our sins and completely forgetting about them. Only I in my humanness remembers them. Thank you, Father, for the promises of forgiving us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now our confession of faith. O oh Lord, you have promised to send your Holy Spirit to be with us and to guide us always. Yet we confess that many times our eyes don't see you. Our hearts can't fathom how you're working in the midst of our pain. Forgive us as we assuming we are in our own through this life. 
Teach us to pray expectantly for your redemption to be completed. Along with your forgiveness, we ask for strength to persevere, for courage to trust, and for patience to wait for the day when we'll be together face to face. Empower us to be your witnesses and give us eyes to see you every day. Through Christ our Lord, we pray, amen. Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, amen. Now I'll open it up for our prayer requests. I don't have any that were given to me before the service, but then maybe you didn't know I was going to be up here. And you were probably looking for Pastor Tom. Do you have any prayer requests? Yes. Thank you. Are there any other requests? Yes. Mm-hmm. I think he went last week too, didn't he? Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Are there any other prayer requests? Didn't have that baby yet. Grandma says so. And I, I don't remember your name, Mark. And I know you prayed, asked for prayer for that last week too. Thank you. Yes? What's his name? Thank you for that. Anybody else? Yes. Thank you, Pam. Yes. And what was his last name? Thank you. Thank you.
the Lord hears our prayers, keep praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that you hear our prayers before we pray our prayers. You know what goes on in our lives, Lord. You know every detail about us. Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It's been over a year now that the hostages were taken. Lord, I pray for your protection on them. I pray for your protection on their families. I pray for your protection on the nation of Israel as we are asked to pray for them by you. I pray for Kathy's radiation, treatments, difficult thing to go through. I just pray, Lord, that you give her strength, that you hold her up and sherm. Be with them both, Lord, their families, just one day at a time. I pray for James Gentry and the infection that needs to be treated in his hip before he gets replacement. I ask that you be with the doctors, that they would know the time to do the surgery. And Lord, we think of our elections coming up soon. Most people say they, can have, they can't remember a time like this for elections in our country. Lord, you know what's going on. You know what we need. You know what we don't need. We look to you in faith, Lord, that our prayers would be answered for our country. And we keep praying, Lord, knowing that you're going to answer. Maybe not our way, but your way. Lord, I pray for the little boy who was accidentally run over and broke the ribs and a few other things, Lord, that you would be with his healing. You would be with that family, Lord. What a devastating thing to happen. Bless them and keep them, Lord. And I pray for Ben, who's back to work after a couple years, breaking bones, and just be with him, Lord, as he gives the glory to you for his healing. I pray for his parents, that you would be with them. And I pray for Mark's daughter having that baby, that you again would be with the doctors and guide them for a healthy child. Lord, I think of all of the prayer requests we have, some were spoken, some weren't. It shows, Lord, how we depend on one another in this congregation. How you want us to act like brothers and sisters, being concerned for one another, being in prayer for one another, loving one another. And sometimes that's not easy, Lord, where we're all individuals. We all have different things going on in our lives. But Lord, you teach us to pray. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our responsive reading is in the bulletin. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. Amen. Let not arrogance come from our mouths, for the Lord is a God of knowledge. The Lord kills and brings to life. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them inherit a seat of honor. He will guide the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall anyone prevail. Now I'll ask for the ushers to come up for our offering. As cable oh, four. It almost ended poorly. Ben's keeping me on track. All right, let's sing when I think about the Lord together. Good morning. Uh, today's Old Testament reading comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 5, verses 4 through 12. 
can be found on page 490, or 464 of your pew Bible. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do inequity. You destroy those who speak, false, who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. But for me, by your abundant loving kindness, I will enter your house. At your holy temple, I will bow in reverence for you. O Lord, lead me in your righteousness because of my foes. Make, me, make, your, my, make your way straight before me. There is nothing reliable in what they say. Their inward part is destruction itself. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter by their tongue. Hold them, hold them guilty, O God. By their own devices, let them fall. In the multitude of their transgressions, thrust them out, for they are rebellious against you. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing your joy. And may, your, may you shelter them, that those who love your name may exult in you. For it is you who blesses the righteous man, O Lord. You surround him with a favor as with a shield. New Testament, James 1, verse 22 through 25, page 1030. But prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers who do duel themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. And today's gospel comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 13 through 28, can be found on page 824. Please stand if you're able. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered, by thorn, gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against the house, and yet it did not fall, for it has been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teachings. So ends today's reading. Please be seated. Actually, I'm sorry. Will you stand back up while we tell the Lord how much we need him? <laughs> Like mine. 
Amen, amen. Good morning, Redeemer. How are we doing this morning? I got to say, by the way, Morrison nailed it. Our main, our main reading this morning will come from, our main teaching this morning will come from our gospel reading this morning in which we'll examine the closing remarks of the most famous sermon in the Bible, the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave in Matthew 5-7. through 7. Before we begin, let's pause and pray. Lord, we thank you for bringing us together. I pray that we draw close to you at hearing your word. But Lord, let our lives be consumed by the righteousness so that not only do we just hear your word, as James says, but we become doers of your word as well. It is in your name we pray. Amen. So before we begin and uh, open up about the closing remarks of, of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, so let's just provide a survey of what Matthew provides in Matthew 5-7. through um, Again, Matthew records the entirety of Christ's Sermon on the Mount in those verses, but you come to find out that Luke also provides a little bit of a bridge version as well throughout his gospel. Um, it is believed that Jesus delivered this message on kind of the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee to which, you know, it provided just a natural theater and a natural opportunity for teaching that the, that the crowds would kind of pin down and focus on the Messiah teaching his word. And this sermon was meant for not, for not just followers of Christ, but just his disciples in general, not just the twelve but the, to explain the meaning of following him and the challenges associated with following him. And if you read the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount, which amounts to about 10-15 minutes of reading, which I encourage you to do, Jesus is explaining what it is to live in kingdom righteousness as a follower of his. Okay, and you see throughout the Sermon on the Mount, he's taking the law to the nth degree, and he's expounding upon the law. He doesn't contradict the law. He's showing you what the law really is. And when you examine the Sermon on the Mount, I come to two realizations. First, it reveals that no person besides Christ is truly righteous. In chapter 5, Jesus addresses moral predicaments starting with the heart of man on matters such as murder, adultery, divorce, being fruitful, what real, what real love actually looks like. And in chapter 6 and 7, Jesus instructs to whom he is preaching how to give how to pray, how to fast, how to handle what we possess, how to rest in Him, how to condemn hypocrisy and to seek Him fully. When one reads the words of Jesus, it is clear such standards are impossible to live up to by the sheer will of man. And because such striving without soul obedience to Christ, without the power of the Holy Spirit, will surely fall short. And a plain reading of the text reveals a second insight in the Sermon on the Mount. That man can never obtain salvation through the obedience of the law. Which is exactly what the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious people of the day were trying to do. But the law reveals mankind's need for a perfect Savior, and that is Messiah Jesus. Six times throughout his discourse, Jesus says, You have heard that it is said, and contrast that, with, the word, with his own words, but I tell you, expounding again upon the law. And what Jesus is doing here is that, you know, the law was that we're seeing that we're opposed to God's true intent of what the law actually meant. And you ask, what's the purpose of the law? Well, Jesus expounds upon that in the Sermon on the Mount in verse 17 of chapter 5. Don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish it but to fulfill it. And may I add, not to fulfill in the way that the scribes intended to, or the way that man interprets it, but how it is written by the prophets of the Old Testament and in accordance with the will of the Father. Christ indicates that He fulfills or completes the law in all aspects. Jesus fulfilled the moral law by keeping the law and living a perfect, sinless life, the mark of the true Messiah. He fulfills the judicial laws indicated in Isaiah 42 by being the manifestation of God's perfect justice. 
And Paul repeatedly details in his letter to the Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians that Christ is indeed, does indeed fulfill the ceremonial law through his death, burial, and resurrection by redeeming man from the curse of the law and ushering in a new era of grace through faith. Jesus, throughout his discourse, speaks with power and authority, so much so that it astonishes those he's, those he's talking to. And in his closing remarks, which we might call you know, the application, if you take homiletics, I'm the only one that probably has, but if you take it homiletics, that's the application portion of one's sermon. That the Lord expresses his deepest feelings to those he's preaching to. It's to say it all culminates to this moment. And when we come to this passage, we realize Jesus' lengthy, lengthy sermon is not merely just instruction on how we ought to live. He is calling His disciples and He's calling each and every one of you to get off the fence and pick a side. In this message, we will explore the contrast between two gates to enter. One of destruction, one of life. We will explore two responses to faith. To obey fully or to live in lawlessness. And finally, we'll discover two foundations on which to build our lives. One that crumbles and one that is strong. First, Jesus contrasts two gates, one toward destruction and one toward light. And if you have your Bibles with you, open up to Matthew 7, verse 12. And I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. And it starts, and this passage starts with the golden rule. Therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. For this is the law of the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide. And the road that is broad leads to destruction. And there are many people that go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, if you find it. So in verse 13, Jesus elaborates on the, on the golden rule. and clearly outlines the exclusive way to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's through the narrow gate. Still, there are two roads that we could follow. In fact, the, if you think about it, the picture of the, gate, of the gates really more correlates to us as an illustration of a, of a funnel. You know, you think, you think of a funnel and you're pouring something into a funnel. You're pouring it into the broad entryway and it distills down into a smaller opening. This is the way of the world. That if you enter in the broad and it continues to narrow down until it leads you down a path of death, destruction, and inter eternal damnation. But when you enter the funnel, the narrow way, more restricted, it brings life. There's great difficulty when it comes to reading this passage. In today's world, be, in today's world because Christ is clearly drawing a line in the sand. It's either me or anyone else. Only through the narrow gate, specific, precise, that salvation is by faith alone in Jesus Christ is God's way of eternal life. But it seems that people nowadays think that is too narrow-minded. And unfortunately, far, many too, too far too many in evangelicalism cite this, passage of, cite this passage of Scripture and condemn biblical Christianity by thinking that we're too narrow-minded. And let me point out that ne sometimes narrow-minded is a, being narrow-minded is a very good thing. Think about if you go in for an appendectomy, okay? Your appendix is being removed. They put you underneath anesthesia. You trust that the surgeon is going to fulfill his or her orders. You wake up and you, and you ask, Doc, hey, did you, get, did you get my appendix removed? And his or her answer might be, oh yeah. Not only did we get the appendix, we got one of your kidneys. And while you're down, the reason why your mouth feels numb is we got some of your teeth too. Because you have an open-minded surgeon. See, sometimes closed-mindedness makes sense. But in a more real, more ma macro way of looking at things, when it comes to religion, many have adopted this idea of pluralism. That's to say that all religions include some truth and that there are multiple paths to God 
by which we can achieve salvation. You see, people unfortunately believe that because we're Christians and we follow Christ, that we can achieve salvation through that, just as people can achieve salvation by following Muhammad or Buddha. And all I have to say is that, say is that friends, that broad-minded sort of thinking is utter nonsense. Proverbs 14, 12 warns us of this truth, saying there is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way of death. It appears right, but nothing, but it is nothing but wicked when it deviates from the truth of God's word. See, what contrasts Christianity from all other religions, as one theologian puts it, is that Jesus' teaching concerning narrowness of the way that leads to life is in perfect harmony with the rest of God's revelation, the rest of God's word. God has given us freedom to make decisions. But the most important decision of our life is whether we choose to follow Christ or not. Which gate shall we enter? Understand that God is not going to pull us kicking and screaming to heaven. Either we are for Him or we reject Him. Still through knowledge of the truth, repentance, genuine submission to Christ as Lord through faith and a willingness to obey His will and His word, God has provided the way for all people to be saved and enter into eternal worship with Him. But again, there's only one way. Jesus speaks of this exclusivity in John 10, saying that He is the gate. He is the way. And if anyone enters by Me, He will be saved. And again, in John 14, He says, I am the way. Focus on the word the. It's not exclusive. I, it is not a way. It might be some way. No, it is exclusive in saying, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Later, Paul reminds his son Timothy, his son of the true faith, Timothy, that there is one God. There is one mediator between God and humanity. That man is Jesus Christ, who gave himself as ransom for all. Understand, each of us stands between two, in front of two gates and two paths. Many people choose the wide path that promises salvation apart from Jesus, which ultimately leads to hell. Few follow the will of the Lord because it's difficult. It's exclusive. And it often comes with hatred with the rest of the world. But still, the only way to spend eternity in heaven with God is to have a genuine relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ, through His Son on the cross. Second, Jesus distinguishes himself with two different responses to his teaching reflecting faith. If you have your Bibles, let's skip down to verse 21 of Matthew 7. And it says these chilling words, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Drive out demons in your name and do many miracles in your name. Then I, Jesus, the rightful judge, will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. In these words, Jesus shows us what true faith really is. One piece of evidence showing that a person has a genuine faith is that their faith actually has substance, it has some meat on the bones. It actually has some backing. Jesus warns of us of false prophets and unbelief in verse 15 when He says, be on your guard. And in a corrupt, sinful world full of violent, vile, wicked people who proclaim to have faith in Christ yet pursue a life down the broad path, distort the gospel and deny Jesus' Lordship while deceiving others. Jesus characterizes these individuals as wolves in sheep's clothing or deceivers impersonating true shepherds and believers. Still, Jesus tells us that we can see through their lies by recognizing them by their fruit. By their fruit, excuse me. Or perhaps a better description 
that marks the essence of a person's faith is a demonstration of their actions that, refl- that reflects a obedient and righteous heart. See, godly and obedient disciples who put their faith in Christ will live, li- will live lives that produce good works. In our New Testament reading this morning from James, it implores that not only are we to know Him as Lord and friend, but we are also to practice righteousness instead of lawlessness. We are to be doers of the Word, not just mere hearers. Such practice of righteousness and good works provides substance for our faith. Yes, indeed, we are saved by faith and not by works, as Paul indicates to his letter to the Ephesians. But if you look closely at Ephesians 2, 8, it says that we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared ahead of us, prepared ahead of time for us to do. Good works are the mark of a true believer that serves as evidence for one's faith. But another indication of one's genuine faith is submitting to the will of the Father. In verses 21-23, Jesus offers, refers to Himself as Lord, implying not only His deity, but His role as ultimate judge as well. Understand that all of us will stand before Christ and be rightfully judged for the authenticity of our faith. Notice that in verse 22, Jesus doesn't indicate that the scribes work such as, such as prophesying, driving out demons, or performing miracles were authentic. Today, there are false teachers, there are pastors that claim to do the right things, teach the right doctrine, claim supernatural works, speak so passionately and fervently that it points to them being a holy man. Yet all too often, many of these men suffer great falls that indicate that they were never really submitted to Christ, never really submitted to Christ as Lord. Today, there are so-called believers that sit on church pews on Sunday morning, put money in the offering plate, memorize Scripture, may be involved in small groups, that still rebel against the Father by living a life of active disobedience and rejection of God. Yet Jesus still sees through His facade as an omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful God. Remember this church, what matters is not the outward profession of the name of Jesus Christ. What truly matters is the deep, personal, inward relationship to the crucified and risen Savior Jesus Christ alone. Those who live in disobedience to the will of God will show the fruit of their life as not a not transformed, transformed person and reveal to them not being true disciples of Christ. Jesus, the rightful judge, will respond to these men and women of lawlessness with those ever so chilling words, Depart from me, I never knew you. Take a moment to think about that. If you're like me, I'm sure some of you have friends, family, co workers, classmates, people in your lives who do not know the freedom that comes from knowing Jesus. That understands that there is an ever-loving God who died for your sins. And in my eyes right now today, we have three populations that need to hear this. Number one, if you're a follower of Christ who is actively witnessing to those who are lost, may I encourage you not to relent, not to give up, don't ever compromise. Jesus says that we are the light of the world. And our job as a true disciple is to share the Word of God and not conceal it. We are at a time in history where spiritual warfare, spiritual warfare excuse me, has never felt so real. But take heart knowing that we do not have to fight this battle alone because in Christ the battle is already won. So stand firm, hold your ground. And do not be afraid or discouraged because Yeshua, Jesus, is salvation. 
for those of you who are followers of Christ and struggle to share your faith. And I'm sure all of us can be looped into that as well. But I encourage you with the Lord, with the words of the Apostle Paul, Romans 1, to not be ashamed of the gospel. Because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It can be difficult to share our, share our faith and our, share our testimony with those we love. But even more so, those who hurt us. But before we share the gospel, we have to live out our common faith by obeying God, following His will, and living a life of a true disciple of Jesus. Remember that the righteous shall live by faith. And a good opportunity to share your faith, to share you know, the joy that comes into your heart, again, is just living by the Word of God and obeying. I've had so many questions asked of me. It's like, you know, why are you all, why are you such in such a good mood? Why do things really never rattle you? And it's because it's that great opportunity to share the testimony of the great work that Christ has done for your life. Never underestimate how good our God has been to you by sharing your story of genuine submission to Him. Because He can use your story as evidence of changed lives and further changed lives. And finally, for those of you who seek the Lord, call upon Him. Call upon Jesus and you'll be saved. God does not save those who do not call upon Him. For those of you that think that you are so unworthy of the cross, that you're so unworthy of Jesus, that my past sin cancels me. That I am unworthy of salvation. Let me comfort you with the words of the Apostle John. That if we confess or say God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And for those of you that have not made a sin, I mean, made a decision to follow Christ. Maybe you let, maybe you lived a life that was on the broad path, but now you realize, Lord, I need you. Don't ever let a moment, another moment, go by and make that decision today. Remember that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. All of us someday will stand before God. Understand that God will not be fooled. Entry into heaven with Jesus rests upon our relationship with Him, submission to Him as Lord, and a genuine faith in Christ and Christ alone. Finally, in verse 24, in His concluding remarks, Jesus describes two very different foundations upon which, the, on, upon which people build their lives. And in verse 24, Jesus begins with the word, therefore. That is to say, it all comes down to this moment. Everything he had been teaching comes down to this verse. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded the house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built their house on the sand. Jesus in this passage can contrast two different foundations. And when we think of the word foundation, we think that's something that's grounded. Something that's tough. You know, a substance that's going to stand the test. And as a football coach, I can't help but think of, think of our foundation as our offensive line. You know, while not shifty and agile, maybe not making the same plays as our skill guys, a good coach knows that a good offensive line opens up the playbook. You cannot win without the big guys up front. Think about it. You can run the ball all you want because, number one, they love contact. You cannot turn an offensive lineman down from running the football. 
You know that your quarterback's going to have time to read defenses on RPOs, quick game, drop back, boots, rollouts, play action. You have no idea what these terms mean, and I love it. You know that as a coordinator, you can call your shots. It opens the entire playbook for possibilities, all because you know those five guys up front are playing as one unit. They're grounded. They're tough. They're playing as one. That's the foundation of a good offense on the football field. In contrast, you can have a bad offensive line that shrinks everything down real quick. Think about it. You, can, you can't even execute, at least in my experience, you can't execute a simple snap exchange. It's tough watching a lot of freshman JV football players play football sometimes. However, it's just kind of the way it goes. It makes you very one-dimensional, and it makes you become so worried about the health and well-being of your running back and quarterback because the offensive line executes like the, United, like the United States border policy by letting everyone through. So by saying this, foundation does matter. The first foundation Jesus describes is the passage of one wise man who built his house on solid, stable bedrock. The rock foundation is a metaphor in Jesus' exact words, the one who hears these words of mine and acts on them. Again, hearing is not enough. You have to act. Those words allude to, G. Christ alludes to, are the very teachings throughout the entirety of his Sermon on the Mount. Every exposition on the well-being of a faith, faithful found in the Beatitudes, or every, yeah, every exposition on the well-being and faith faithfulness that's found in the Beatitudes, the moral law, the behavior of a true disciple, worship, all those things listed out in those previous chapters as taught by Christ serves as the, as the foundation of a wise and obedient person who builds their life upon Christ. It is through faith in the one who obeys or puts to action the words of Jesus who can stand in the storm and turmoil. In contrast to the house built on the rock, Jesus alludes to a foolish builder who builds his house on the sand. And the sand speaks of the weaknesses of our flesh that continually attempts to achieve salvation by our own righteousness, by our own means. That under the weight of righteous judgment, it pales in comparison and it fails to meet the standard that Christ has set for us. Each day of our lives, we're constructing a house that symbolizes our growing walk with Christ. And while the exterior of the house looks immaculate, there's spacious rooms, there's strong walls, tall ceilings, high-end appliances, everything looks great. The, that house will fall and cave under the rain and storms if it's not built on the solid ground of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's why if you're lucky to even get covered, I mean, that's why, you know, you look at these houses recently with these hurricanes that have happened, or houses built on the coastline, if you're lucky to get insurance, your coverage is through the roof because insurance companies understand that it's a lost cause. It's built on seeking sand. Likewise, our lives will crumble if we merely just hear the words of Jesus and not do what He says. We can call Jesus as Lord, but have a blatant disregard for everything He has to say and live as a liar and a hypocrite. Again, something that he condemns in the previous chapters. That's faith on the sand. A faith that stands tall, a faith that holds true, and a faith that weathers the storm is one that is built on the foundation of an active and obedient faith to Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Life is a never-ending cycle of bombardment and trouble. There is no place where we can completely escape tension, trouble, or trauma. The winds will come, the floods will rise, and the rain will pour. But the life that, hold, that builds and holds and clings to the cross and is built on the foundation of obedience to God will not crumble and will not falter. In this illustration Jesus gives, I'm reminded of the great hymn written, written by William Bradbury in the 1960s, The Solid Rock. Who happen, he happens to also be the one that wrote the hymn, Jesus Loves Me. 
And you might remember some of the words. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. That when darkness veils His lovely face, I rest upon His, His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchors holds within the veil. That when He shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. For it is on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. May our lives be built on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. Now to close, as I said earlier, the entire purpose of this passage, passage that Jesus details to us is that He's forcing us to respond. He draws a line in the sand. It's forcing you to make, it, make a decision today. Jesus offers us two gates. One that leads a path to destruction. One that leads toward light. He presents two, uh, two responses. Either, reject, re, either we reject Him or we're faithful to Him. And finally, he illustrates two foundations. One on the sand and one on the rock. I encourage you with every fiber of your being, with every act, that you choose Christ today and every day. He's our saving grace, our living hope, our solid rock on which we stand. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your goodness and grace. For Your Word, for being our firm foundation, Lord. Let us not just merely hear this Word this morning, but be active participants as faithful disciples. Let us not grow weary by the storms of this life, but continually rest and abide in You. Be that firm foundation on which we build our lives, Lord that will withstand the tests of time and all trials. I pray this in your holy, precious name. Amen. We're going to sing a song about His love that never fails as we choose Him every day. and covered 
by the power of your great love. My debt is paid. There's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out. this week, be doers of the word, be beacons of light for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week. Son and